Welcome and thank you for attending the American Driving Society's presentation, Driven Dressage, The Basics with Shelley Temple. Tonight we're going to talk about Driven Dressage and we're very happy to have Shelley Temple with us this evening. Before we get started in the presentation, um, I'd like to encourage you to download her presentation. It's located on the AmericanDrivingSociety.org webinars.asp webpage. You can download her presentation, but you can also download a copy of Training Level Test 1. She's going to talk about that a little bit later on in her presentation, and it might be nice for you to be able to take notes right on that actual test. I'm briefly going to go through a little of the, a few of the features of GoToWebinar to make sure that everybody's familiar with how to participate in our webinar tonight. On your screen, you'll have a toolbar. And on that toolbar, you'll have a box that says questions. This is where you can type a question into the questions log right here, and it will be sent to us. During her presentation, if something comes up and you'd like to have uh, your question answered, just pop it in that questions log, and we'll be viewing those all throughout the presentation. And then periodically, Shelly will stop, and we'll take a few questions and continue on. Chances are we're probably not going to get to all the questions, so after the presentation, we get a log of all that information, and Shelly will be able to answer the questions that she wasn't able to get to live. And then we'll post that up to the webinars page in a little bit later. Now, this toolbar has a tendency to dock and hide itself to the right-hand side of your screen, and you might kind of lose it. So if you want to make sure that it does not hide on you, click on the View button here on the top of your toolbar, and then uncheck this Auto Hide the Control panel. If you uncheck it, it will always remain on your screen. If it's a tad bit annoying for you, you can click the arrow at the top and it will minimize to the right. When you want to use it again, click on that arrow again and it should expand to the left. Now, if you run into a little bit of trouble with a GoToWebinar, you can go to the uh, webinar uh, webpage, excuse me, and download a quick reference guide, all right? And this has got some tips and, and, and information about how you can troubleshoot, like your audio doesn't work, you're having trouble with your speakers, your mic, it won't log in. This will be a little help for you if you run into any kind of trouble. Here's this web page. You'll find the link down here on the left-hand side on the blue uh, navigation bar where you can click on that webinars link and come back to all the things. Everything here that's listed that we've recorded is listed on this page. So if you want to go back and view a webinar that maybe you missed, you can go back and uh, review it over here. Now I'd like to take a moment to express upon you how much we'd love to have you as a member. If you're not an ADS member currently, we'd really like to encourage you to join and help support us in just a small thing is these educational webinars. All our memberships are anniversary based. So if you join today, your membership is good through the previous month's last day. So it would be March, the end of March. We have a member rewards program where you can receive discounts at vendors like John Deere. Uh, we also have an award-winning host of publications that you see on the right hand side, uh, the left-hand side of your page there, the WHIP, the Omnibus, the Buyer's Guide, and the Wheel Horse, all to keep you in tune with what's going on in the driving world. We also offer a, a few awards programs, including a Recreational Hours to Drive program. And we have some members that are already approaching their 250th hour pin. It's pretty exciting. We'll also send you a membership pin so you can display your membership proudly when you go to other driving events. So I encourage you to join today. You can join from our website, or if you experience a little trouble, you can always give us a call on the phone. And that number is 608-237-7382. Now one more thing I'd like to just chat with you about before we go over and begin talking with Shelly is that you might have received a, a pledge request in the mail shortly for the American Driving Society um, ADS fund. And if you have a chance and you have a little bit of extra around and you'd like to send it in, we sure would appreciate it. The ADS fund goes to support activities like this webinar. It also goes to support our presence at the World Equestrian Games. And we would like to really do a great job of showcasing our sport to the world. So if you can 
and you can want to fill that out and send it into us, we sure would appreciate the don any donation that you could give. Well now, without further ado, we're going to go to South Carolina and join Shelly Chemp Shelley Temple and encourage our driven dressage gurus out there to give it a try. So hold on one moment and we'll be switching to South Carolina. Okay, Shelly, we're ready to take it away. All right, thank you, Susie, and welcome everyone to Driven Dressage Basics. Um, I want to thank Susie for setting this up. Susie, I need to get rid of that little box there. Uh, Can you just, see that on your screen? Yep, it just went away. It's just a little pop-up from your window. Okay. Should be all right. Okay, huh? great. I can see your screen just fine. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Susie has some web poll questions that she's going to ask you. Um, if Susie, you're ready to put those up now. Yep. I'll we'll click have on a that. quick poll and we'll... to learn a little bit more about our audience this evening. Okay, we're going to launch our first poll here. Have you ever competed in a driven dressage competition, including CDE type events? And we have people registering their votes. By the way, right now we have 243 people joining us. Okay, looks like we're done voting. We'll close the poll. And I'll share it out with everybody. So it looks like we have 68% that have competed in a driven dressage competition and 32% that haven't given it a try yet. Let's go to another one. One moment. One moment. Okay, here's another poll. What was the highest level you competed at? Training, prelim, intermediate, or advanced? Okay, let's close that poll, and we'll share that out with everybody. Wow, 45% at training, 36% at prelim, intermediate had 11%, and advanced 8%. And we'll do one more here. Are you planning to compete this year? Wait for a couple more seconds while everybody clicks the right buttons. And we'll close that poll. And we'll share the results. There we go. We've got 76 people are going to give this a try this year. 24 aren't quite there yet. And we'll do one more poll so Shelly can get a real overview of who's out there. Will this be your first experience? And we'll close that poll and we'll share that out to everybody. Looks like 31% said that this will be their first experience. 69 said they're veterans. So that's great. 
Okay, we'll hide that poll and we'll go back to Shelley. Thanks, Susie. That was a interesting information. Have a better idea of our audience tonight. So my hope is to take a little of the mystery out of driven dressage. Often I hear people say they just want to get through the dressage in order to go ahead and do the hazards and the cones. I'm hoping with a little bit more information, you will find dressage a lot more fun and understandable and enjoy that part as much as you do the hazards and cones. So the first question people tend to ask me is, what is a judge looking for anyway? How can I get a better score on my test? And how can I improve communication with my horse? We're going to start with theory and an understanding of the dressage training scale. This scale was originally called the German training scale, but we've stolen it here. And now it's just known as the training scale or the training pyramid. And this is used by riders and drivers everywhere around the world to train their horses and by judges to evaluate this horse's training. It's shaped like a pyramid and the beginning steps at the bottom and it goes up to the very top to collection. Each step builds on the next. It is also used to form a better partnership between you and your horse. So you don't need to be a competitive driver in order to use the training scale, understand it, or appreciate it. So we'll go through each step of the scale and tell you a little bit about it. The first step is rhythm and relaxation. It's the first and most important step in the training scale. It affects all the steps on the scale and makes your horse a pleasure to drive or not if you don't have it. It includes mental and physical relaxation. Both of those allow the horse to step in the natural rhythm of each gait. Now, as you know, walk's a four-beat gait, trot is two-beat, canter is three-beat, and the rein back should be two-beat. The horse works with his back when he's relaxed. He takes regular steps and lengths of stride in all gates and transitions, and he tracks up. The definition of tracking up is that he steps into the footprint of his front foot with his hind foot, into that step or slightly ahead. If a horse is tense and not relaxed, often he will not step up and track up. Tempo is a key part of this step. Tempo is the rate of repetition of footfalls in a gait, either fast or slow. And every horse has a tempo in which he can relax, balance, and swing. It's very, very important to find that tempo for each individual horse, and that will vary upon his level of training and his level of strength. This is something that you need to work with every day to find the best tempo for your horse in each gait. Regularity of steps and strides in all gates means that the horse walks and then trots in the same tempo. For example, often what we see, and pretend that I'm the horse's feet, trot, 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 kind of fall in a heap, and then walk really slow, walk, 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 and speed up. A good rhythmic transition would be trot, 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 walk, 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 walk. In rhythm, in tempo, stays the same. The next step on the training scale is suppleness and looseness. Suppleness and looseness builds on the first step and cannot exist without them. If your horse is not relaxed, if he's not stepping in the correct tempo, then he cannot be relaxed and loose. There's several types of suppleness. 
One is lateral suppleness, which is sideways bend. Lateral bend is a degree which the horse can bend his body and neck sideways on a circle. And the correct bend is consistent from head to tail. The horse slightly bent to the inside of circles and figures. Very often we see horses with too much neck bend. When their bent is de the neck is bent too much, it locks the rest of their body up so they cannot be soft and supple. When you bend your horse, you just want, to, it's a subtle amount of bend and flexion. You just want to see slightly more of the side of his face, not losing track of the whole outside of the horse. When I'm bending, I want to see a little bit of that outside blinker. Longitudinal bend is over the top line from head to tail, over the top. It's the looseness of the pole, neck, back, and haunches so the horse can stretch forward onto the contact, onto the bit. This includes the horse's frame or his outline. You want to be able to shorten it or lengthen it at will. It should match the work he's being asked to do. For example, in working trot, his nose should be ahead of the vertical. He should be stretched in a little bit longer outline. And then when he's in collected trot, the outline will shorten. He will be higher in front, lower in the back. It will be a compressed frame. A lengthened frame, the horse should stretch out and down. And that's asked for in lengthened trot and in the lengthened walk. In a free walk, you should be stretching out down to a larger degree. So your goal is that you can shorten and lengthen your horse's frame whenever you want. Not talking about a headset. We don't want to position the horse's head in one place as he stays there when he's doing different jobs. The head and neck stretch out. The whole frame of the horse lengthens when we ask or it can shorten as we ask. The level of horse's training and strength will say how much he can lengthen and how much he can shorten. Here's some photographs to demonstrate that. Uh, on the left is a horse, the same horse in both pictures, so as a five-year-old. And that, that picture on the left was the total degree that he could shorten his frame at that time. He did not have the strength to go shorter than that without becoming tense. And you can see as a nine-year-old, he can shorten his frame quite a bit and also lighten his shoulders and raise up in front. Things to look for so you know your horse is supple and loose is his mouth is closed and he's mouthing the bit quietly. A big one is that his tail is swinging softly almost makes a little J shape as it swings from side to side. And that your horse allows himself to be driven forward from back to front, pushed up to your hand. That you're not constantly pulling him back, that he's allowing you to drive him. Here's a photograph that shows suppleness and looseness in a young horse. I like this picture. You can see the horse is stretching to the contact. His back is up. He's tracking up nicely, as you can see. The whole picture is a nice, soft picture. The next stage in the training scale is contact and connection. It's acceptance and response to the aids while in a round outline of the mouth that's relaxed. It's a soft, supple, constant contact with the horse obedient and submissive. And submissive doesn't mean he's a robot. Submissive means that he is accepting your aids, he's cooperating with you, he's willing to participate. Good contact can, can be seen as we discussed when the horse's back is raised, his quarters are engaged, he's tracking up, his pole is the highest point. His jaw is relaxed. 
and his nose is a bit in front of the vertical. It's not correct at any point for the horse's head to be behind the vertical. So those three first steps, rhythm and relaxation, suppleness and looseness, and contact and connection, are important for any horse to learn. Any horse that's going to be a pleasure to ride or drive needs to have those components. Think of that as the horse's high school education. And the next three are part of his college education, starting with impulsion. Impulsion, we're looking for energy, not speed. Free-flowing energy and lively active steps. You can see a horse here showing good impulsion. It's shown when the horse steps under his barrel, engages his hocks and the horse shows a desire to go forward. Here's another photograph, the horse going from collected trot to extended trot, and you can see the degree of engagement there, and his haunches lowering and his front end rising. But impulsion isn't just during transitions or at the extended trot. It's that desire always to move forward. The marching walk shows energy. The active, bouncy trot shows impulsion. The next step is straightness. Horses are crooked by nature, just like people. Good training focuses on developing both sides equally, so he steps through equally. And straight can be on a straight line or on a curved line, but it's when the hind foot steps into the line of the front foot. The last stage of the training pyramid is collection. It's the holy grail. It's the hardest thing to achieve. So each step builds on the next till the horse is strong, supple, has enough impulsion, that he can produce collection. True collection requires a lot of strength, especially for a driving horse, I feel. Also for a riding horse, but the driving horse has to be able to collect and continue to pull the carriage forward. So it takes an awful lot of strength. Things to help you identify correct collection is you're looking for the lowering of the haunches, the lightness of the shoulders and forehand, shorter and higher steps, more bend in all the joints of the hind legs, the withers look higher, and the horse seems to move uphill. The neck is raised higher, and the head becomes closer to the vertical. One really important note about collection and it's, it's never achieved by pulling back. Collection is really the most energetic and forward of all the movements. So if you get the feeling when you're watching someone work on collected trot that they're pulling the horse backwards, that's not collection. Collection is a very, very forward movement with the horse softly accepting your hand and allowing, him, him, allowing you to compress him and stay active. Each step of the scale builds on the one below it, but you're working on each step every day when you work your horse. Um, you're working towards collection, even with a green horse, every time you halt, every time you do a half halt. Even though he's not ready for collected trot, you are laying the base there. Every time you straighten your horse, every time you bend him correctly, that is a step towards collection. So you have an emphasis on the lower levels of the scale as you're bringing the horse along, starting with relaxation and moving into um, straightness, moving into impulsion, moving into looseness. You're still working on all those stages as you're confirming the lower steps. So, questions on the training scale? We're getting a few questions coming in right now into um, our tool here. Um, I've got one question that says, um, 
Her horse puts his head up and then comes off the bit at the diagonal trot out. Any idea where this might be coming from or where maybe she needs to go back on the training scale a little bit? And well, without seeing it, I can say that um, it sounds like she's losing relaxation and perhaps rhythm as well and that the horse is not loose and supple and so she's losing something in the corner for the lengthening and the suppleness and the looseness also goes along with the horse stretching his frame out and down for the lengthening so she really needs to go back to the very bottom of the scale the relaxation and make sure that she has that first um, it's better to do a few strides of lengthening, come back to working, than a few strides of lengthening, than just run across the diagonal. And I see a lot of people kind of get their horse tense because they make it a little bit of a scary prospect to come across that diagonal and have to work that hard and running off balance. So a lot of little half halts uh, uh, help the horse balance around the turn. Maybe don't go so deep into the turn, so he keeps his balance. And then gradually allow him to lengthen his frame out and down, then ask him to step up into it with a little more energy and lengthen stride. That might help. How would you start to teach that relaxation? Well, I think that's something that comes from every bit of work that you do with your horse on the ground as well as in the shaft, between the shafts. Um, he has to be mentally relaxed, and we'll go over this a little further along about uh, how to prepare him for training. But um, it goes back to his diet, his turnout situation. All of those things can contribute to um, tension and lack of relaxation. Um, his past experiences may have been ones that didn't foster relaxation, and you need to go back to the very basics, walking, transitions from working walk to free walk, allowing him to stretch down and relax his back. And uh, it takes a while with the horse that has been taught incorrectly or has the wrong idea about what is expected of him, but you really have to go back with that slow work. Um, then building into some trot work, again, slow, relaxed figures, serpentines, circles, things like that tend to soothe the horse and give him a little busy work so he has something to focus on. That helps relaxation as well. Where does balance come into the training scale? Balance really is throughout the training scale because a horse cannot be balanced if he's not relaxed. Um, I think it really keys in with suppleness and looseness because tension and lack of suppleness disturbs the horse's balance. Um, I think those two are the key parts where it starts in, right at the very beginning. And I often see people going too fast for their horse's level of training and balance, and so that comes into the tempo equation, which is part of, part of the first uh, building block. All right, uh, here's another one. Um, this person is coming from a riding background, and she asks, how do you develop a bend through the body not having to use your leg and your seat? Well, you can take your riding aids and bring them over to driving. I mean, the horse can learn to bend correctly under saddle, and you can take those same rein aids to help him understand what you want between the shafts. But um, we could talk all day about this topic, but basically, and we'll cover this a little later in our talk this evening, basically you want to use your outside rein to help you bring the horse's shoulders outside on the circle and a light bit of inside rein to ask him to just flex slightly and stay soft and supple on the inside rein. You're lacking that critical inside leg to push him into your outside rein so you can use your whip to assist you there lightly on his barrel but you can also teach him those rein aids so he understands how you want him to um, to carry himself around the turns. A critical part of it when I see people doing tests um, is that often they go too deep into the corners for their horse's level of balance 
And so really the person is throwing them off balance in every single corner and that ruins the next movement. You need to take nice wide turns and keep your horse in a comfortable uh, level of balance for his level of training. Okay, I think that's a good plethora of questions right there. Uh, why don't we move on to the next segment here? Okay. Preparing for your dressage test. We're going to go over some basics um, that you need to know about that will improve your understanding of the test and your understanding of what the judge is looking for. Number one is know your test. I'm amazed at uh, how many people haven't really thoroughly read and studied their test. They've just gone over the pattern and kind of vaguely know their way around and that's what they go with. To really do a good job driving a test, you really need to know it thoroughly. First of all, on every test, um, on the side with the diagram, is the purpose of the test. It states very clearly what, they, what is expected at this level and exactly what they want to see, they being the judge. There's instructions on the test. As you can see, this one, the training level test one, it tells, tells you to do transitions through the walk and that they're looking for a longitudinal stretch and moderate lateral bend. So really, at training level, they want to see your horse not bent to the outside, but he doesn't need to show a lot of inside bend. Just straight and not bent to the outside is acceptable. A, a little greater degree of bending is great. We're happy to see it. Um, and that longitudinal st stretch, doesn't, he doesn't need to be on the bit. He doesn't need to be round in a very round frame. He just needs to, he does, can't look like a giraffe either but uh, he has to be stretching to the bit. Very important that transitions are made through the walk because for a training level horse's level of balance, it's very difficult for him to come from a trot to a halt without becoming tense and without the driver having to use too much hand. So let him walk into the transition. That's what's called for at this level. The judge wants to see it and it would be very helpful for your horse. The directives listed on the test are what the judge is actually judging in that movement along with the broader sense of what he sees of the training of the horse. So you can see in that first movement, they're looking for the straightness of the center line, on the center line, the balance in the transition, and the quality of the halt. Those are the things that are being judged. So read each directive so you understand exactly what the judge is looking for. Be very clear about the starting and ending point of each movement. As you can see in this movement, the movement doesn't actually end until the next one starts. So if you were, you were going, it would end at C, when the circle left began at C. That movement would go all the way to that C, C marker. and read carefully the number of seconds that they want you to halt. And in this test, it doesn't have rain back. This is the only one without a rain back, since it's a first test, test for many people. But you also want to read carefully how many steps are required in the rain back. These things are the essence of those movements. That movement number 10, halt three to five seconds and salute. Your entire score is based on that. So if it says three to five seconds and you halt one second, or you halt 15, that's not correct. You're not fulfilling the requirements of the test and you can't get a good score. So if it says three to five seconds, that's how long you want to stand there. Same with the rain back. If it says two to four steps and I see you back seven, I'm going to wonder if your horse is backing at your command or he's running backwards. I want to see that your horse is obedient and soft and supple and reins back the exact number of steps. They're giving you a leeway there from two to four, I would go for three. And then if I got one more or one less, it would all work out fine.
There's a description of the gates and movements that's required in each test. In the rule book, in the dressage pages, and also in the pages that describe combined driving, there's a very good description of each gate and movement in the, in, in the test. Those are exactly the things that you're being judged on. So it's up to you to learn what's being looked for. Um, if you read the information on a lengthening at the trot, it tells you clearly the stride has to be lengthened out and down. The horse has to be tracking up. It has a thorough descript description of each gait and each movement. If, again, if you do not fulfill the requirements, then the judge can't give you a good score. And believe me, the judge wants to give you a good score. We, we like nothing better to have a beautiful horse and driver come down the center line and knock our socks off. We really want to give those good marks. But you have to understand where you're going here. They can't possibly do a good job if you don't understand the requirements. So please, please read the rule book. Read what's asked for. And then you have a good shot at doing it. Shelly, just a couple of marks. Shelly, just sure. a couple of quick questions that were pertaining to some of those comments that you made. Um, sure. One was, how do you count the steps in a rain back? Um, list the leg movements. Well, the rain back is a diagonal movement, so it's a two-beat movement. So it's it's just like the trot. One, two, one, two. So two steps would be one, two. Two diagonal pairs going. One, one diagonal pair and then the next, that's two steps. Some of the tests have a number of meters instead of a number of steps. And in that case, what you need to do is figure out how many meters, how, how long that is, and how many steps of your horse's rein back fill up that space. If your horse moves during the halt, does the judge like start the time over, the three to five seconds, or does it run as soon as you stop? Uh, to me, it runs as soon as you stop. And there's a certain amount of leeway at training level. But, you know, so if a horse wiggles for a second and stands, to me, at training level, you can still get a good mark. If an advanced horse does wiggles around and doesn't stand, then that's, that's a big deal at advance. I'm expecting that horse to stand stock still, sway, square and straight. So it's a matter of what's, what's expected at that level. At training level, if the horse stands quietly and still, he's not absolutely straight, he's not a little crooked, I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. He's done his job. If you, if you have the straightness and a square halt, then that's just icing on the cake and an even better mark. But I do keep the level in mind when I'm judging those types of things. And I've got a great question here that I'm sure a lot of people are thinking of. But as you approach a letter and begin preparing for the next movement, what part of the horse's body should reach the letter before starting the next movement or turn? I have heard shoulder as well as head. Is it the same as ridden? No, it's not the same as ridden. And ridden, it's the rider, when the rider gets to that letter. In driving, it's the nose of the horse. And... Um, when you make a turn in driving, you're turning onto a line. Say that you're going across a diagonal. You're turning onto that diagonal line between those two markers. So you couldn't turn the horse at the letter and be on that line. You will have already overshot the line. You have to turn in time that that horse can smoothly and in a balanced way turn onto that line then we'd be looking for you, if it was the long diagonal, to go over X and then smoothly come onto the track as you change the bend with the horse's nose at that letter. So you're driving more on the line. And I, I didn't include a lot of geometry in this talk, but I think that's definitely uh, fodder for the next webinar on dressage. Ooh, great. More things to come. <laughs> All right, Shelley, why don't you continue on with your presentation? Thanks for taking that little break. No problem. Um, I love questions, so please keep them coming. I think that helps everybody understand. Um, the collective marks at the bottom. As you can see in the ADS test, um, all the collective marks are doubled. So these are extremely important marks to get a 
get a good score on in order to get a good overall score on your test. Um, so read those carefully. And that's where many judges make very helpful comments in those boxes at the bottom and what they've seen that was good and bad of your test. Really take that to heart. Really read those comments and you'll see a trend. So you may say, oh, this judge doesn't like spotted horses and I have one. You'll often see the same ones crop up over and over again. You really want to pay attention to those. Gates is the first one. And that covers walk, trot, and canter at the advanced test. And actually, there is an intermediate canter test as well. Good, good paces must be exhibited. And good paces mean that the horse is rhythmic. He's relaxed. He's exhibiting what needs to be seen in that pace. So uh, at the trot, we're looking for the horse to track up and step into that footprint of that front foot with his hind foot. At the walk, we're looking for him to overstep, at least by one footstep, if not two. Um, we're looking for even steps of the same length, the hind legs both stepping through evenly. And if one pace is incorrect, then the score will be affected. As an example, um, if your horse took uneven steps uh, throughout the test, then it may affect your gait score. If the horse has a super trot, but his walk is lateral, which means that he almost paces, he swings the legs on one side, almost very, too, very close together, almost at the same time, that's called a lateral walk or a pacey walk, then that's not correct. So that will affect your gait score as well. Um, often what I see, the horse looks a little uneven during the test, is because the driver has pulled the horse off balance around every turn. And even though that's the driver's problem, and I will comment on that, that goes to your gait scores too, because I've seen uneven steps. Impulsion is how the horse moves forward. If he's elastic, I think almost like of a cat, a panther, that's an elastic kind of movement. If the horse's back is supple and relaxed and the hind legs are engaged and the energy is allowed to come through the horse right up to the bit, does the horse track up? As we discussed before, that's really key. When I first see the horse come in, that's the first thing I look, in, look at is his hind end first. And I want to see the energy and desire to move forward throughout the test, in the trot work, in the walk work. Submission, we went over this ex, uh, definition at the judges clinic and I really did like this, the fulfillment of the criteria of the, of the test, that the horse allowed the driver to, to drive him through the test. Um, you see it when it's a sense of cooperation, uh, a sense of harmony and lightness and ease of movement, the horse accepting the bit and the horse light on the forehand. Even at the lower levels, you can see a horse that's submissive. He gives over his will to the driver. Um, it's willing response without resistance. And one of the key things looked for in some of these movements, like the rein back or the halt, is your submission. If the horse willingly reins back, if it halts quietly where asked and stands quietly, those are key to your submission score. So there's most tests, there's at least three halts. I can't tell you how many people that I see that go through a beautiful test, but they've slapped into the halts and the horse never stands still. And you've given away 30 points or maybe, maybe even more there. Um, it's, it's something that can be worked on every single day. And it helps your horse understand more what you want, become more relaxed because you've shown them clearly what you want. So it's very, very key. This is a pair of horses that competed at the Pony Championships in 2007. Beautiful pair of halflingers. And I have to say that was one of the most harmonious tests I had ever seen. Both, both ponies and the driver were all completely together throughout the test. I'm not sure you can see all of that in this photograph, but I, it makes me smile every time I see it because I remember that beautiful test. Here's a horse that could be a little more submissive, um, kind of acting out a little bit. 
his test is done and he's had enough of it. Um, I won't name any names, but I think that's a great picture too. Your driver score. Um, one of my pet peeves is a driver seesaw the reins, or does he have a soft contact throughout the test? Is he balanced? Does he have good posture? Is he workmanlike and organized? And the biggest key, does the horse help the driver help or hinder their horse throughout the test? What I mean by helping the horse is that the horse is prepared properly for each movement so he can be balanced and do them to the best of his ability. So I'm looking for the driver to do those things, to help their horse around the test. We've had a couple questions here, people asking how judges feel about talking to your horse. Um, too much, too little, um, what are your um, feelings on that? I'll say what, I'll say what Dr. Vetter, Vetter said to us at the judges clinic, wait my lady, wait, it's coming. <laughs> but uh, I, I will cover that, um, it's, it's coming up shortly. But yes, you, it, appropriate talk and appropriate use of the whip is welcomed. We want you to, to go in there and drive your horse. So not loud, not obnoxious, not shouting, not angry, but quiet, calm commands to your horse are very appropriate. Using your whip carefully when needed, very appropriate. So feel free to do those things. We want to see you do those things. And when I see someone do something appropriate with their whip or their voice, then to me their driver score goes up in my mind because they're really driving the horse. They're not just a passenger in the cart. Any more now that we want to answer before we go on? Um, there was one other whip one. Hang on a second. Let me find it back here. Uh, collective marks on driver. Are you penalized for not using the whip if you don't have to? Or are you supposed to demonstrate that no. you know how to use the whip? No, if your horse doesn't need the whip, then that's appropriate for your horse. So no, but if I feel that the whole test, your, your horse was lacking energy and impulsion, and you didn't touch him once or ask him to go forward once, then I, I think that's a, something I'm expecting of you as a driver. So I would like to see you do that. But no, if your horse goes beautifully without him being touched with the whip, then that's perfectly appropriate for your horse, and, and I'd love to give you a good score too. Okay. Um, one thing that's asked often of me is if, if someone has a difficult test, we've all had those where our horse is not on the same page as we are, upset by something, whatever, and uh, if I see someone drive very tactfully and carefully and do the best job possible in dealing with the situation, they may get some pretty dismal marks on the rest of the test on the movements if they're poor, but they can still get a good driver's score. And we've all been there, so we all understand how it can happen. So um, we're appreciative of that. Okay, continue on, Shelley. Great. Okay. Going off course. This happens to everyone sometime. So let's just go over briefly what to do if this should happen. First of all, before you go in the ring, you want to know if there's a whistle or a bell in your ring especially if there's another dressage arena close by or the cones course is close by. Because it is a little scary when you're in there doing your test and you hear a whistle or a bell, you want to know if it's for you or not. So make sure you know that answer to those questions before you even enter the ring. And often the, uh, ring, the gatekeeper at the ring will tell you where the ring's stored. But say you're driving down the long side and you kind of dawns on you that you're pointed in the wrong direction. And just as that thought is crossing your mind, you hear a whistle. You want to stop, turn around, and go over to the judge. The judge will either from the, the booth or the box or the car or wherever he's judging from, get out and tell you where you went wrong and tell you where to start again. Often someone goes astray and the judge blows the whistle, and the person says, oh, I know what I did, I messed up, and they just whip around and start again. And you've done a couple things uh, to yourself there that you don't need to do. Number one, 
you haven't asked the judge where they want to see you start over again because they're going to rejudge that whole movement that you went astray on. So you want to get that information so you do it correctly. And number two, you've gotten a penalty. As you see at the bottom there, um, there's five penalties for the first one, ten penalties added on for the second one, and the third one is elimination. Often you're a little flustered if you go off course. You're already getting that five points for the first penalty. You want to walk over to the judge and take a deep breath and get yourself together. You've already gotten the penalty, so take the time to do that. There's no reason that you cannot salvage this and have the rest of your test be super, but you can't do that if your, your head is still spinning. So take that time, please. Often when people are in a big hurry after the first one, the first uh, going off course, they do it again and even a third time. So I don't want that to happen. I'll understand the first time. The second and third time, I'm just going to be sad about it. I hate blowing the whistle. So please compose yourself, take your time, make sure you're absolutely clear about what you did wrong and where you're going to start over. Don't be afraid to ask the judge a question. Say, uh, I thought I was going to go right then and circle. Is that correct? Confirm that in your mind before you go on. You really want to read your rule book. There's no excuse now because it's on the website for free. So get in there and read what's expected of each level. As I went over before, the explanations of each gate and movement, how they're being judged. This is going to be your Bible. You're going, the judges study this. You need to study it too to, go, to do a good test. And here's some just little things to touch on. This is not everything in the world you need to know to drive a test, but a few things to go over. You have 90 seconds after the bell rings to enter the ring. That's plenty of time to get all the way around the ring. Don't be in a hurry. Don't careen around the corner and come in all crooked and disorganized. Take your time. Get down where you need to get. And I'll tell you a little secret. Judge is not, not, is not timing that with a stopwatch. If you're 91 seconds, no one's going to say a word. But be workmanlike. Get on down there. If you're ready to start your test, go ahead and go in. Um, I also point out that you can't be made to go before your designated time. They can ask you if you'd like to go early in the warm-up ring, and you can say yes if your horse is ready to go. But they cannot make you go early. So if you need that warm-up time, very politely say you'd like to go at your assigned time. Don't be rushed into it. You can use your voice and whip appropriately during your test. Um, no bad language, please. Do you see that sometimes? Somebody's cursing their horse out. And if you're that mad at your horse, I can't think things are going very well that day. So uh, I'm probably going to feel that uh, a, a, a score, a good score is not really going to be in order. Accuracy is very important. It shows off your horse's training and shows that you're focused and concentrating. It's not the be all and end all. But accuracy, along with a good performance, is very impressive, and you're going to really maximize your scores. Diana Brownlee at a judge's clinic said that a show, the show ring is a theatrical performance. Your dressage test is a theatrical performance. And if you look at it that way, that you want to maximize your horse's good points and minimize his poor ones, that's, that's the way to show him off. You want to leave the ring it's called for in your, on your test sheet. Uh, all the ADS tests that I'm aware of, it's at a working trot, although I did an arena driving trial this past weekend, and that test does say to leave it at a walk. So um, follow the directives on your test. And make sure you leave the ring at A. This is really important in those rings that aren't completely filled in, but are some poles on the ground with gaps in between them because you can be penalized for leaving the ring any place other than A. So, questions about preparing for your dressage test? Susie, you there? Yep, I'm just reading through all the questions. Sorry, I'm getting okay. my bearings here. We've got quite a few coming in here. Um, 
can you just kind of go over a little bit again the training level one I see a third incident as 15 points then elimination on the fourth incident please clarify that again okay let me go back here there it is right there first incident five points second incident ten points third incident elimination see where I'm pointing that's what I'm seeing. I'm not sure where you're seeing the... So three strikes and you're out, basically. <laughs> exactly, yes. <laughs> three strikes and you're out. And really, trust me, no judge wants to blow that whistle again. We really feel sad. Really We've, feel for you. I've had quite a few questions here about length of whip. Can you um, kind of go over that a little bit more in detail? What's the proper length of whip uh, to use? Well, what's, what's called for in the rules is that you should be able to touch the shoulder of the forwardmost horse. Um, so with a single or a pair, that's pretty obvious. With a four in hand, you got a little longer reach, so you have to have a longer lash. But um, it's, a lot of it is personal preference once you're able to touch that shoulder. Some people prefer a whip with a longer shaft and a shorter lash, and some prefer the shorter shaft and the longer lash. Um, I do want to see a whip with an arch top, not just a buggy whip, which we do see sometimes. Um, and I want to be able, I see you to be able to use your whip correctly to help your horse. But um, besides that length, I think you need to pick something that works well, it's easy for you to carry and that you can carry at the correct angle, which is 11 o'clock um, and out over the side of your horse. Okay, on a disobedience, what would you as a judge look at where you'd want to penalize somebody for disobedience? Uh, disobedience? Can you give us kind of an example? Um, well, I can, and it is in the rule book. Uh, it's uh, kicking, bucking, rearing, and I think that's, that sums it up. There might be a few other incidences in there. Um, that's a fairly new um, ruling. And before we covered it in the test itself and marked down accordingly, and obviously it would go to submission too. You would get a poor score on that if your horse was acting out. But now it is defined there that there has to be a penalty for that. So those, those three things, and, and anything that I felt was a danger um, if the horse was running backwards, something like that, if I felt that was danger, I would consider that a disobedience. Fortunately, we don't see that very often. Okay, um, we often see a whip salute performed by holding the whip straight up and straight out to the side of the driver. Is that an acceptable salute, even though that method is not described in the rule book? Actually, the method, uh, you mean out to the side, that is not in the rule book, I agree. I would not penalize someone for it, but I would mention it in my test, in my test comments because um, I, I, I think that's an attractive way of doing it, but it's not called for in the rule book. What's called for is the whip, the handle of the whip, um, the butt of the whip in front of your face horizontally or vertically as you nod. So that's what's technically asked for in the rule book and technically you could be marked down for the doing the one out to the side. Occasionally I'll see somebody uh, put their whip down on, and touch the tip of it on the ground when they salute. That's definitely not right. Um, so I would, uh, I would uh, give a, a, a penalty for that. Okay, uh, going back to the disobedience thing here, what about if a horse shies at a marker or a judge's booth or flowers or somebody sitting there with an umbrella? How do you think the judges interpret that kind of thing? Let's say a training level. Okay, well, first of all, it's a horse. It's not a robot. So I, I, I'm not surprised that it acts like a horse, and I'm not gonna, it's not going to be a big deal. Again, if you read the rule book, it says that if something hap occurs once, it can be overlooked totally by the judge. Um, but if it happens throughout the test constantly, then it does have to be commented on and penalized against. Um, for example, what, what it refers to in the rule book is shying and tripping. So those things, uh, and if something did happen, like 
long ago when I invented, uh, a horse got loose on the cross-country course and galloped right by the dressage ring where I was doing my dressage test. And my horse had a mini meltdown and we went on and the judge overlooked that and, and said that to me at the end of the test. And I would do the same. And it is possible if something outside the ring happened beyond your control that the judge could ask you to start over. So um, that's, that's uh, I think the judge wants to be fair about it. So uh, I think they're going to keep uh, that in mind. And if your horse did something that was really beyond your control because of the circumstances, they'll work with you to have a good solution to that. And again, that's at the levels too. At training level, I would understand that. At advanced level, I might expect the horse to deal with some of those things. Okay, how about when a dr driving a single horse with a two-wheeled vehicle and no navigator aboard the cart, is it appropriate to sit in the center of the seat during the dressage test or should the driver sit on the right like you see more often in pleasure driving shows? Uh, it is okay to sit in the center if you feel more comfortable. Uh, it's in the rule book for pleasure shows, I believe, that uh, they prefer that you sit on the right, but uh, there isn't a ruling like that in combined driving. So sit where you're comfortable, that's not a problem. Can you describe a proper salute for a lady? Um, to put the butt of the whip in front of your face, either the, the, rip, the whip vertical or horizontal, and then I just do a quick nod. You're not supposed to bend over or bow, but just a quick workmanlike nod. And uh, the, a man can um, take his hat off or he can leave his hat on, although I know men that do not take their hats off often have a comment about an incorrect salute. I don't think they've been penalized for it. And if you have a helmet on and you're a man, you definitely do not have to take your helmet off. Okay, uh, let me see if we got one more here. I was trying to find one that I saw a moment ago. Uh, when a test has presentation on the move, is there some point where that scoring is done or is it throughout? What considerations can you recommend to maximize that score? Well, I think of the, how, when it's judged varies from judge to judge. I do it as the horse is coming in, an overview throughout the test, and when the horse is leaving, I look up again and finalize that in my mind. Um, maximizing the score, that could be a whole other webinar on uh, how harmonious your turnout is, but I'd say the best way to help yourself in that regard is to make sure that no one part stands out more than the other and that your horse is the thing that your eye is drawn to, not just the driver or just the carriage. The horse first. I think that you need to showcase your horse. You need to maximize uh, how impressive he looks. And so if you can do that in the context of, of um, having your turnout be um, pretty formal or fancy, just has to be harmonious, really. A country turnout can be as striking as a formal turnout. How much might you penalize somebody, an entry, uh, for using a marathon vehicle? There's a lot of talk in, uh, among the upper level judges and the European judges because in Europe they, they have come to the determination that um, you can't get higher than a five or six at the advanced levels without, uh, with a marathon carriage if you use that for all three phases. But um, really my criteria is that it's clean, neat, well fitted, um, and, and that is really what I'm interested in. So if you can do that in a marathon carriage, um, then you're going to get a good score. But I have to say that someone that's really knocked themselves out and has a beautiful harness and beautiful carriage and totally beautiful turnout is going to get, uh, going to get the best score. So I don't think you're penalized against the mar with the marathon carriage at the lower levels, but uh, I don't think I can give you the same score as someone that has a stunning turnout. Okay, uh, one other question here. When backing and you have a four-wheel carriage and it cocks while you're backing it up, you kind of jackknife the thing, how much do you kind of discount that? I'm looking at the horse 
and not the carriage so much. So if the horse is straight, I'm taking into account that the terrain may not be absolutely level. But you can maximize your chance of staying straight by having a really straight halt. So coming into it balanced and straight and square. Those people that have that halt usually have a good shot at keeping their carriage straight. But no, I just look at the horse. So, um, but if you can pull it off and the carriage stays straight too, that's even better. Okay, why don't we move on to the other section here. Okay, I'm going to go up a couple slides here. Okay, so I put together a few strategies, training strategies. Um, obviously, we don't have time to go into a lot of things in depth, but I want to go over a few key points. These are the most important parts of the talk this evening as far as I'm concerned. If you don't take anything else away from this talk, I really hope you will think of these three things when you think of training your horse. First of all, you want to have a clear mental picture of what you want. If you were going to go traveling in New York City and you had a map of Boston, you wouldn't get too far. You have to have a clear picture in your mind of exactly what you want from your horse if you have any hope of getting it, if you have any hope of communicating it to your horse clearly, and if you have any hope of being consistent when you do that. So please, please have a clear mental picture first. Mark the behavior when it happens as a reward. And what I'm talking about here is, I'm not a clicker trainer, but I think this is a good way of thinking of it. When someone uses clicking training, clicker training, they click exactly when the animal is doing what they want. You need to find a way to do the same thing with your horse. So you are in essence saying yes to him every time he gives you the response that you want. And the way I do it is that I give slightly to my horse when that happens. I use my voice as well, tell him how wonderful he is, but I have developed a timing so when he does what I want, I very quickly at that exact second give slightly, give my rein to him so he knows that that's my yes. When he understands that that's the yes and use that consistently, you're going to be able to dial him in, tune him in to the correct response of what you want. And when you make it clear to your horse, by and large, you're going to get what you want. And the third point of this very important group is to be consistent in your request and your rewards. You can't one day ask for something and reward it and the next day allow something else to happen and reward it. That's that's so confusing to the horse. Horses do not like surprises. They like consistency. It's really, really important to keep that in mind during your training. So you want to be as consistent as possible. Every day you're asking the horse for the same things and rewarding the same things. If you do these three things carefully every day, your training will grow by leaps and bounds. What's in it for me, the horse thinks. There has to be something in it for him. So when you're getting ready to train for dressage, before your training starts, you have to make your horse as comfortable as possible. Make sure that he has enough exercise, he's got enough turnout. Make sure his diet is correct for his amount of work and that needs to change throughout his, his working career and his seasonal work. Make sure that his teeth are done on a regular basis and his mouth is comfortable. Um, and make sure that he um, gets, gets cared for in a way that makes him comfortable and happy. Chiropractic work can be wonderful if you have a good chiropractor and I highly recommend it from my own personal experience on myself and on my horses. You want to drive with your aids, not with corrections. So you need to have a neutral contact. Each horse and each driver have an amount of contact that they're comfortable with. Um, and if, 
a driver has a barn full of horses, each individual horse will have its own preferred neutral contact. What I mean by that is that imagine the amount of weight in your hands. Some horses might like six ounces of weight. Might, some horses might like a pound or two pounds. It's that horse's comfort level. And if you listen to your horse, he'll tell you what he likes and what he's comfortable with. You want to drive him with that neutral contact. When you need to make a correction, then go ahead and correct him, and then reward him, reward him by lightening your contact for a second, and then going back to your neutral contact. You want to make sure that you're driving with your aids, not corrections. Often I see somebody that they think their horse needs a half halt, so they take five pounds of weight in each rein to do a half halt. And then they stay there. They never lighten, or they lighten back to four pounds, but that's not their neutral contact. They're driving defensively and not giving the horse an opportunity to relax and go back to that neutral contact. You have to trust your horse a little bit. Don't be afraid to correct him, but then finish the correction. A good correction is quick to the point and over with, and then back to neutral. Every day you need to make sure your horse understands that he needs to be active and forward. Um, I had a friend once, I saw him at a show, and I, he did a great dressage test, and I said, what happened? Wow, that was super. And he said, well, my horse wanted to go forward today. And I said, well, you can't wait around until he feels like going forward. He has to go forward every day. He has to understand that that needs to happen. That means, again, we're going back to being consistent. You need to use your aids. If he doesn't go when you say, then there needs to be a repercussion. You need to touch him with your whip. You need to urge him forward with your voice. Something must happen when you make a request. You do this consistently day in and day out, and your horse will respond. You want to encourage your horse to be a body mover instead of a leg mover. A body mover, we've all seen these horses, that their body is kind of in one place, stiff and, stiff and tight, and their legs move around a lot. Sometimes it looks really impressive because the legs often are, are swinging around all over the place, or their front legs especially are spectacular. But their body and their back and their hind end are not really in, an, in the movement. A body mover is a horse that's soft and supple and elastic, and when he moves, all his muscles move along with him. That's what we're looking for, a body mover, not just that the fancy kind of uh, trot. For example, um, we watched an interesting video at the judges' clinic, and uh, they called it a tournament trot. I love that word because it's very fancy and showy, but it wasn't correct. The horse wasn't really moving correctly and using his whole body, not moving from, from back to front. Teach your horse to respond to your aids promptly. And teach your horse to respond to your voice aids. Don't use your horse's mouth as a break. This is really, really key. Your horse needs to learn to stop or do anything else by understanding what you want when you use your aids. And you don't want to just haul off and shut your horse down and make him stop with, you, with your hands. You want to teach him to respond lightly to your request to slow down, slow down, organize, and then halt. In balance. A lot of people do this inadvertently. And you really need to give it some thought. Are you doing that? Are you using his mouth as a break instead of as an aid? And use your hands to shape and guide your horse instead of using it as a brake. You want to have the level of finesse that you can use your hands to bend your horse, to straighten your horse, so it's not a weapon. Woe means woe. As we talked about uh, in the test, uh, many, many horses will not stand. Now I understand we're at a show, the environment's a little different, but I see these same horses at home and they're not standing there either. Any horse can learn to stand if you take the time to work with them. And it starts on the ground. When you bring the horse out of his paddock or out of his stall, he has to stand in the cross ties. You have to use this, use this work every day. And the cross ties when you're putting two in the carriage. 
And you start out little by little with the young horse or the green horse with the horse that you're retraining. You start out little by little. He stands for a second. He stands for two seconds. He stands for five seconds. You reward him each time, and gradually it becomes longer and longer and longer. But it's not going to happen if you don't work on it day in and day out. It's a very important skill to me, one of the most important skills that a driving horse has to be safe. Rain back. Many times people just haul their horse backwards. They pull on the bit until the horse finally, after wiggling around and throwing his head in the air, decides that maybe if he backs up he'll get away from the pressure in his mouth. That's not a good rain back. The way you teach a rain back is to teach your horse on the ground from your voice to back up. I do this in the wash stall, in the grooming stall, when I'm handling my horse every day, when I'm backing him up to the carriage. Every day I use my voice and I ask politely with my hand. If you use this every day, then you can guide your horse backwards step by step. That's what we want to see in the dressage test. I don't want to see your horse running back. I don't want to see him, as soon as he starts backing, not stop. I want you to be able to guide him backwards deliberately by step by step. That's a horse that's submissive. That's a horse that's obedient. Little tips, don't change your equipment right before a show. You have to get, if the horse has to get used to new equipment or changes your equipment. If you have a show harness, use it the week before the show and use the bridle every day before the show for a week or two. Everything fits a little differently, even if you've tried to adjust it as closely as possible, uh, the same as your everyday work harness. So make sure that you give the horse, use the horse a chance to get used to the little, little nuances that make it feel different to him. And very important, a good warm-up that sets the tone for your test. You need to work at home to see exactly what kind of warm-up works well for your horse and how long he needs to warm up before he's listening and soft and supple. That varies so much from horse to horse, but that's the key to getting good consistent performances at shows, is to have a good warm-up routine, and when you get to a show, allow some extra time, so if your horse needs it at a show because he's a little rattled, uh, the weather's windy, he's just been clipped, whatever, but when you tune in to that same warm-up routine that you have at home, that you do every day, when you're away from home, it's amazing how quickly that settles your horse and focuses him. And he says, I know this. I knew this. We do this every day. It really, really helps to get him on your side. Have a planned warm-up. Try and see what works. Now it's on you to work on your driving skills. Obviously, it's great to take lessons if someone's close by, but don't think that because you don't have an instructor close by that you can't get a lot of improvement of your driving skills by doing some different things. First of all, have someone video you and analyze that by yourself with some friends. Watch driven and ridden dressage whenever you can. You can learn so much by watching the warm-up arena, actual tests, um, ask questions when there's other people there. Um, read as much as you can about driven and ridden dressage. Unfortunately, there's not an awful lot of driven dressage texts to read about, although we have some good articles in the WIP and Driving Digest. Um, you can transfer a lot of that information from Rin Dressage and learn a lot more about it. It's, uh, it's very accessible. There's a lot more information about Rin Dressage online and in books and magazines. So don't be afraid to learn about that. And volunteer to scribe both at driven shows and Rin Dressage shows. Again, that, that Rin Dressage work transfers over to what we're looking for as well and will increase your understanding. Volunteering is a great way to learn. You don't just have to scribe. You can be the gate opener and closer and see lots of tests every day, and you can ask questions about them. Um, it's really, really important to get out there and improve your driving skills, and you don't need a lot of money to do it. 
Some of the best um, clinics that I've been to really didn't cost any money. One of them was uh, where we all brought bits and we tried different bits on our horses and drove them in those bits, had our friends drive our horses in those new bits so we could see what good and bad came out of it. And uh, also good clinics is where we've taken the time to video each other and without an ego, we sat down and watched the views and commented on each other and we were very honest and straightforward and no one took offense. That didn't cost anything. So you don't have to spend money to learn. So don't be afraid to get out there and make it happen. Um, you can go and watch and audit clinics. That's another good way. Um, ask a, a someone that needs help at a show if you can, can help and ask questions at the same time. That kind of thing is invaluable. A little bit, and this is again another topic we could spend hours talking about, but Often I see people that don't prepare their horses at all for a turn. So you want to position your horse before a turn and flex him slightly to the inside before you actually turn. Allow him to fill up your outside rein. Move his shoulders slightly. The feeling of moving to the outside, although they're not actually moving to the outside, the feeling that he's moving into that outside rein. Good turns and good transitions are all made in the preparation. It's just like those of you that were riders. Um, if you were coming to a jump, the way to get a good jump is to bring your horse to the jump in the correct balance, speed, and position. Once you're at the jump, there's nothing you can do. You can't fix that jump while your horse is in the air. A turn is the same way. It's all preparation. If you have your horse in the right position, the right balance, then you can glide to the turn and he can use his inside hind leg and bring it up and underneath him and you can have a beautiful thing of beauty. But if you don't prepare for the turn, wait till you get there and just yank your horse around the turn, like unfortunately I see often, there's no way your horse can save that turn or do a good turn. Work on your timing so you're in sync with your horse. Make sure you're helping your horse with his balance. Don't pull him off balance with too much neck bend, with too much use of the inside rein. By holding him to the outside, I see this a lot where people are holding their horse, trying to keep him on the track, uh, and he's bent to the outside the whole time because they're trying to hold him in position. And don't pull him off balance by making your corners and turns too deep too deep for this level of balance as we discussed earlier. Briefly, we'll just go over the rein aids that we use. Um, the jobs of the outside rein are to control the amount of bend, to regulate the tempo, to lengthen and shorten the horse's frame, and to straighten and assist with balance. The jobs of the inside rein are pretty short and sweet. They're to indicate direction, to flex the horse, and to help him bend, not to steer. The inside rein is not to pull on and steer your horse, because that's going to pull him off balance. And the other important job of the inside rein is to keep the horse soft and supple. So, questions about basic training strategy? Love to hear them. Okay, we've got a few questions here. Um, how deep should I go into a corner at training level? Should I be rewarded for doing a high level, higher level quality turn at training level? Well, we're back to I would go as deep in the corner as your horse can handle to keep his balance. Um, and yes, I would reward you if you could do a balanced, rhythmic, Beautiful turn, beautifully bent turn at training level, yes, I would reward you. But if you're able to keep your horse in balance and do a, a quarter of a 20 meter circle or a quarter of a 30 meter circle in the corner where you were on the track, drove smoothly through a turn and back on the track so you didn't skip the corner, then that's what's called for a training level and you could get a good score. 
Hey, you described um, how to make the turn, but if you can't use that inside rein, then how would you suggest to turn? Can you describe it maybe in a little more detail? I can, but it's probably, like I said, we could probably spend a whole webinar about that. <laughs> so I will go over it briefly. I think Shelly's Shelley's going to be on every, every week. <laughs> I don't know that I need to be. There's plenty of other people that, that uh, have an interest in this and are good at it. Um, but basically, I position my horse. I really want to drive the horse's shoulders. I guess this is getting down to the nitty gritty and the nuts and bolts of it. I want to drive the horse's shoulders and his body, not his head and neck. I think we've all been in the position where we had the horse bent one way and he continued going another way. His shoulders and his body went straight while we thought we were turning left or right. So. The shoulders really control things, not the horse's head and neck. So I would position him to the outside a bit on my outside rein. I would control his shoulders with my outside rein. And I would use my inside rein to flex him slightly to the inside. If I felt he wasn't listening, I could touch him with my whip on the inside on his barrel or up near the saddle. Um, and then I, as he, as he flexed and started to bend, then I could give both reins forward slightly so he could stretch around the turn. Um, that's how I accomplish it. Um, but I think it's all, as I said, positioning before you get there. So if I'm coming down the long side and I have a turn in the corner, by the time I get to the corner marker, I've already checked in to see if I can move the horse around a little bit, if I've if he's listening to my outside rein, I do a half halt to help balance him. And then I see if he'll flex a little bit on that inside rein. I do all those things before I get to the corner. If I wait till the corner and I don't have those things, it's too late to get them. So I check in early. And I might even have him a little flex slightly for the turn before I get to the corner. So then I, when I'm ready, I can just glide through the corner by giving my reins a little bit. Shelly, can you describe how you'd give a proper half halt in driving? Again, another topic that could be hours <laughs> on end. Um, in driving, it depends. There's, there's a number of different half halts. And uh, some are with one rein, and some are with both reins. So a basic speed control half halt can be on your outside rein or with both. And the, the keys of a half, a good half halt are, first of all, it's not a half halt till the horse thinks it's a half halt. So if you were doing all the things in the world and nothing was happening or getting through to your horse, then you need to change it up and try something different. Um, but a half halt lasts three seconds or less. More effective if you give slightly before the half halt, close your hand. You might need to give your horse a little cluck forward so he comes into your hand and then forward out of the half halt. And um, if he needs another one for speed control, that you do the three seconds, you get out of that half halt, give, and do another one. It's not one long, steady pull. And think of a half halt as organizing your horse for what he needs to do. It's a little heads up. Something's going to happen now. It's a little attention horse. Something is coming up. I want you to organize your body and get yourself packaged and paying attention so we can do it. So it's a brief movement, three seconds or less, closing your hands, and then ask. You really technically, as some people think of it, you're slowing down the front end slightly and then pushing the back end up. And it's a little pause in the stride if you did a really big half halt. You're basically connecting the back to the front again. And we could, like I said, we could go on forever about that. That is probably a whole webinar on a good half halt. <laughs> well, this might apply to this, this question. Uh, with a pair, one is too forward, the other one is just right. How best way to handle this or correct this? Um, there's a lot. There's a lot that can be done. Um, first of all, I think pair horses need to be driven as singles as well to work on their basic training. 
um, but there's, uh, you can make some changes with your reins and move your coupling reins up or back. So the horse that's a little over eager, you can use a little bit more rein on him without bothering the slower horse or the more obedient horse. Um, pair, you know, the old saying, there's one horse wants to work really hard and the other one wants to let him. The whole key to driving a pair well is to get the horses working in the same equal amount. And part of that is by doing half halts, part of that is having your equipment set correctly, um, and part of that is that daily training of the horses either in the pair or as a single, um, listening to half halts, being able to shape and mold them, um, being able to have them on your aids so they're up to your hand and soft and supple. Okay, we'll take one more question. Um, if we go off course and the whistle is blown, which judge do we walk up to, the one at sea or the closest judge? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, it's always the judge at sea. The judge at sea is the one that gives the penalty. You're not given the penalty by all the other judges. If there's three judges, you don't get slammed with five points each. You get you bet penalized just by the judge at sea, and he's the head judge, so you would go to him. That's a great question. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to just mention one more thing to our audience. Um, the American Driving Society does have a book called The Manual for Driven Dressage. And if you're interested, you can purchase this off the website. Uh, hopefully that with the 300 people that are on, if everybody goes and buys one, we may run out online, but we still have more uh, back in our um, stock. And this is a great manual for you to go through. It has wonderful pictures in it showing the proper framing. Uh, it was created by the who's who of driving. Um, the chairman at this time that this book was created was Heike Bean. And most of you are familiar with uh, some of the books that she has written. So if you're interested in, you know, expanding your driven dressage knowledge, this might be a really good book for your library. Okay, I'd like to thank everybody and especially thank Shelly for spending this uh, afternoon with us or evening, early evening. We're a little bit over time, but the questions that we weren't able to get to in uh, Shelly's talk will be put into an FAQ and we'll post it out on the website a little bit later. If you'd like to um, review the webinar, it has been recorded and it will be posted up to the ADS website in a couple of weeks. So again, thanks Shelly and thank oh, everyone. You're welcome. I enjoyed it. Yeah, it was a great. And thank everyone for uh, joining us. Have a good evening, everyone. Good night.